Hello everyone. Oh, the mics are working. Magical. Um, my name's Isabel McNeil and I'm a fellow at Trinity Hall at the University of Cambridge. Uh, my research area is French and film. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Rabeniak. I'm a lecturer in English at Magdalen College, Cambridge, and um, I specialise in visual culture and interdisciplinarity. We're going to start um, by talking a little bit about tactics uh, because I came into the job that I do directly out of my PhD. I just finished my PhD. I was very fortunate and I got a, a job in a Cambridge college. So, you know, I was excited. I was feeling good about myself. Um, and as the years went by, then I had children um, and I, you know, I, I started feeling the, the strains and the pressures of the job increasingly. And after a while, I noticed that, um, you know, people were overtaking me in the in the sort of career ladder and um, then then my mum died and I was just devastated we were really really close we were best friends really and so all of these things kind of came together and I realized that there was something profoundly missing something profoundly wrong with the experience of this job that I loved um, why did I want to do it? I wanted to do it because I was curious, intellectually curious, because I loved film. I was a massive cinephile because I wanted to write and I wanted to talk with students about how to write about film and how to discover French culture through film. Um, and suddenly it just all felt like there was something massively missing in all of this. And one of the main things that was, was missing was a sense of creativity. When I had my kids, I started um, sewing and it became like a guilty secret that I couldn't tell any of my colleagues because it would seem too I don't know too homely and too domestic um, and then I started talking with people and I discovered that actually some of my colleagues who I knew very well also had these creative hobbies on the side and I thought there's something wrong that that has to be secret you know why couldn't that nurture our intellectual endeavors why couldn't that be a part of what we talk about with students and at this time, I happened to be reading um, The Practice of Everyday Life by the French philosopher Michel de Certeau. And I came across this brilliant idea that, that he has um, called the peruque. The peruque, it just literally means wig in French. Um, but what, what it means, it's when, um, it's when the workers basically use the resources of their employers for their own purposes. So they're not stealing, they're not directly taking things from their employers, but they are um, perhaps taking a bit of time, carving out a bit of time to do something that maybe that, that is not directly part of their paid employment. And they're doing this in solidarity with the other workers, so together they are kind of uniting in this tactical way. And I thought, yeah, we could do something like this in Cambridge. Cambridge needs us to do something like this. So we need to do something like this to sustain our, our sense of aliveness in academia. And so colleagues and I started um, collaboratively, and that was obviously, given what I've just said, hugely important aspect of it. We started this group called Tactics and Praxis. Praxis being the idea of making, being the idea of doing something practical, which in Cambridge seemed to be rather frowned upon, um, and uh, bringing that together with um, this tactical approach where we were going to use the resources of the institution itself um, to work against it. And we were thinking, you know, here we, were, we weren't just thinking about our own kind of feelings of, of, of lack, really, but we were thinking about all of our students. We were thinking about the mental health crisis amongst students. We were thinking of um, the institutionalised racism. We were thinking of the institutionalised sexism. And we were thinking about ways to resist all of this by coming together in creative ways. Um, so we started doing some seminars. And in the very first one, we booked a room, so that was part of it. We got some funding from the institution, we got rooms from our institution. Um, so we were using their resources and using our time. Um, and we walked into the room and we just thought, this is an institutional space, we've got to do something about it. So um, it became very much part of our, of our way of doing things that we would always have, uh, we would always dress the room. So we would always bring things to 
humanized to soften this institutional space so today even today because i thought today here in the hat tent you know we wouldn't really need it but somehow even today it's it's a way of kind of changing that atmosphere even for us as speakers it makes us feel like our creativity can flourish in this space um, and this is my tea for tactics <laughs> cushion that I made full of all kinds of donated fabrics and gifts. Um, we're very much interested in, in gifts um, and sharing and exchange in our, in our group. Um, and one of the first um, people to come to these tactics and praxis seminars that, that became a whole movement really um, was Michael. <laughs> and so um, Michael has been part of part of it from the beginning really because he was always there um, so I think that's where I'm going to hand over to Michael now who's going to to say a few words in sort of in response and in dialogue with tactics and praxis yeah I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, a new experimental university that Isabel is, is very much part of and really which grows out of tactics and praxis and takes on board all that Isabel has just been saying about the need to bring in that stuff that is marginalized, that is cast asunder by the notion of professionalism, to bring in ideas of creativity, the body, the hand, craftspersonship. And so the new school of the Anthropocene um, is, is something that I've, I've been pulling together for the last two or three years. It's a, it's a collaboration with the October Gallery in, in Bloomsbury. And I guess what we're trying to do here is to bring this, um, the, the, the ideas that Isabel has just shared, into a more institutional milieu and work out how we can change the institution of the, of the university itself. Because we've, we've got a very significant framework here of biopolitical emergency, you know, an immediate future that was prophesied in last month's IPCC report of unimaginable climate catastrophe, species extinction, desertification, sea level rises. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. And of course, this is taking place alongside a rise in authoritarian regimes that undermine the very reciprocal basis of civic society across the world. So the question we're asking with this new university is, is how, do we, how can we reshape the institution to address this in the context of the university's own crisis of marketization, instrumentalism, paralyzing levels of graduate debt, and also crucially, the, the denigration of the arts and the humanities, which has been accelerated even further by the government's recent announcement of a 50% cut in funding to courses from this year. So the question we want to ask is how do we best equip students to deal with these problems, give them the necessary critical and creative confidence to make interventions um, to ensure the perpetuation of life on Earth. And so the, the, new, the new school is rooted in an understanding that the current models of higher education are increasingly unserviceable. They're steeped in what we can think of as managerial realism, that, uh, a way of running an organization that cannot think outside of bureaucracy, tiers, compliance, an erosion of trust, a need to define every relationship and practice. How do we move away from an institution that now openly simulates the practices and the inequalities of corporate business? And this, of course, includes the scandalous pay levels of vice chancellors, which are now edging towards £400,000 a year, while the majority of undergraduate teaching is undertaken by casualized, casualized uh, staff. So this is a sector that's marked by overworked, demoralized, overmanaged lecturers um, and students who are struggling with very significant mental health an anxieties. Anyone who's been involved in higher education over the last 10 years, I'm sure, can testify to this extraordinary ex acceleration in dis-ease amongst the students. And I think this probably hit a new low last year with the, um, the gamble with student lives that was undertaken by universities, instructing students to return into residence in the full knowledge that most teaching will be conducted online. The reason for this, of course, to collect the student rents, and we had that ghastly spectacle of security fences erected in Manchester to incarcerate students. This is a, a very much a consequence of the 2012 
government funding settlement, which transformed students into financialized units and plunged many higher educational institutions into crippling levels of debt. So to our mind, this is an extraordinary way to run a public service. So we're exploring what the viable post-COVID university might look like. And in so doing, we find that engaging with a mainstream is increasingly difficult. Hence the need to consider parallel shifts, alternative forms of organization, where, whereby agency might be recovered by the individual and the collective alike. And crucially, that principle of conviviality might be restored. So the new school is one such response. It's a self-organizing, cooperatively founded. It's, it's run by academics who come from Cambridge and across the university world in collaboration with artists and practitioners. The aim of the new school is to run this as cheaply as possible, as non-bureaucratically as possible, with minimal tuition fees as a means of releasing students from the tyranny of debt. There are no governors, boards of trustees, managerial tiers. Everyone is paid the same. We, we hope to take our first cohort of 15 students um, next September. At the moment, we think the fee will be 1,900 a year. We're hoping to attract bursaries. There will be no degree awarded. Um, the idea being that recognition is not necessarily the same as accreditation. Um, and the key question is, how do we design a curriculum that reflects educational value beyond the enhancement of personal market worth? So at the new school, the, the students will co-design their learning. Uh, they'll be regarded as researchers from the very beginning. Um, and, they, and with the recognition of all of us are creatively generative, intellectually curious, and we'll be assigning equal stress to the critical and creative act, to individual development and collaborative action, and to the hand and the body as well as the mind. So this implies that there will be more traditional higher educational activities such as philosophy, literary criticism, visual culture, film editing. We have Anthony Wall from BBC Arena and Chris Pettit, the uh, independent filmmaker, who will be running editing courses. But there will also be courses in permaculture, soil stewardship uh, at the Sitopia City Farm down in Greenwich, dance, printmaking, creative writing and even wild swimming as overseen by Isabel. So it's a kind of Black Mountain College, this great experimental institution in North Carolina that ran in mid-century. Um, a Black Mountain College for the digital era is the way we like to conceptualize it. The point of departure is Felix Guattari's 1989 book, The Three Ecologies, which is about the intersecting and interdependent spheres of the mind, society, and the environment, with meaning being made both within and between those spheres. And the major impulse here is that sense that we, we can do better for our young people and for returning adult learners, which at the moment means these people need to acquire a 60,000 pound debt as a threshold to adulthood to in ensure some kind of form of social participation. It's a debt that's of course serviced currently at 6% interest a year. Now, this, just to give a bit of further context before we open this up, uh, this, this week there was a survey for The Lancet uh, that was pre-published called Young People's Voices on Climate Anxiety, Government Betrayal and Moral Injury, a Global Phenomenon, that interviewed 10,000 young people under the age of 25 from 10 countries. And it revealed that three quarters agreed with the statement that, quote, the future is frightening. 50% reported feeling distressed and anxious with regard to climate breakdown and its effects on their daily functioning. So in such a context, the new school will seek to explore how a higher education might prepare students to forge new and viable futures to be passed on to the generations to come. How the university might shift away from this relentless focus on survival in the present, preparing students to compete for a job, reproducing the destructive practices of the present. And that includes what the late David Graeber termed bullshit jobs. Last week, the Vice Chancellor of the Highlands and Islands announced his intention to cull, and I quote, vanity courses in the service of workforce alignment and supply. And in so doing, 
he exposes a dualism between that higher, the traditional higher educational function, which is the exploration of knowledge, of how meaning is actively made, and that new preoccupation with training and skills. We're preparing students to operate administrative procedures, rendering them, quote, office ready. So the public university is here quite damagingly being reinvented as a trade school. So in such a context, we want to ask how, edu how higher education can recover those more expansive horizons by serving the imagination and in so doing address ecological collapse and restore confidence in a participatory democracy. So this is not a sentimental bid to reinstate a pre-1990s version of the university. We've had screeds of brilliant analysis on the effects of the 2012 marketization in the LRB, in the Guardian over many years. But it's a bid to create a more agile institutional model, less constrained by business practices and open to collaboration with other arts and educational organizations. And one that could ideally be kept small and replicated and rolled out regionally. So the new school is, is really a supplement, not a replacement of the HE mainstream. One that insists that the function of a college is to teach students rather than provide them with the uni package. It's an ethos that of course is not for everyone, but it is for anyone. And to sum up, I just want to call up two recent articles. One came out this week in the Irish Times, had a, uh, a very fine journalist, Finlan O'Toole, who identified a broader international effort, and I'm quoting him here, to make education more and more managerial, to insist on a rational relationship between inputs and outcomes, to reproduce only those forms of knowledge that we already have. It is now anathema to tolerate a system that allows people to do things we haven't planned and cannot measure. And the second piece is from the Sunday Times, from the 8th of August, that expose the proposals of the university to continue online teaching in the new academic year in response to pandemic demands. And this piece framed binary relations between producer interests, by which it meant university teachers and administrative administrators, and what it called consumer interests, the, 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 the students themselves. And it railed against the, the control that it was imposed upon the later group who'd made a personal investment in their education. And the, the piece frame this in terms of an infringement of consumer rights. I, I'm interested in how we got to this awful place, this false and destructive set of assumptions, that final internalization of marketization in this wonderful environment of the university. So coming from completely different positions, both pieces I think view higher education currently as a set of willed premises to be fulfilled, an administrative spoon feeding of a finished product rather than a shared investigation and a negotiation of meaning between teacher and student. So in the face of this rather mechanistic customer notion of education, we're looking to explore how we might restore the adventurous life of the mind as a legitimate value in and of itself. How we might re reconcile those producer and consumer interests. And as we face the very real prospect of the end of life on earth, how do we reinstate that principle of wonder before the world? So neither of us, in our respective um, actions, have definitive answers, but we're keenly aware of the questions, I think. OK, thank you. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.